you there, Jeff, in East Side, over the across the pond. Across the um, pond. Yes. Unfortunately, uh, Kate can't join us today. Um, she called across, in sick. Yeah, she called yes. in sick. Come She'll on, need Kate. A doctor. She'll need a doctor's note. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, and especially, especially for this one. Um, because uh, this is going to be a new series of videos. It's going to be, I think it's six or seven in total. Seven it's going to be because we're starting with two, no eight chapters. We are looking at truth and science. And I'm going to insist on calling it truth in science throughout this, uh, throughout this series of conversations. Um, and I'll be digging into why I want to insist on that, so like e probably even in this conversation today. Okay, so why, why are we looking at truth and science? Um, this is mainly uh, because Kate really wanted to, but I have also been looking deeply into this when we did all our work around the philosophy of freedom. It is hugely useful to understanding some of the subtleties uh, that are briefly mentioned in the philosophy of freedom and you're given a whole completely different um com complementary background into like the questions that steiner introduces in the philosophy of freedom um and uh it's also uh has a secondary title um which goes by the name of a prologue to the uh, a, a prologue to the philosophy of freedom or the philosophy of spiritual activity, which as we work through this series should become really clear to people who are already familiar with them, uh, with the philosophy of freedom. Um, so I'm really looking forward to this. We're going to be getting into some, some really interesting philosophical ideas and both Jeff and I and Kate, when she's back with us, will be endeavouring to to turn them into something that's real rather than abstract concept, concepts, but so that we really understand how this is relevant to today, to a book that's written over 200 years ago. Yeah. Um, do you want to add anything on the intro, Jeff, or should we just to like dive in there? Just that um, your insistence on calling it truth in science uh, pops for me suddenly right so you've you've toggled back and forth <clears throat> between what is the the english translation is truth and knowledge and um uh knowledge is often um considered to be synonymous with with science and it should be <laughs> However, yeah <laughs> in a perfect world it is <laughs> we've got a problem here yeah. uh houston um uh science is is uh um beyond the pale epistemologically so so uh, to rein it in I, I think is a is no small task but a very important one of our day because yeah. we're all embroiled in it that's right okay so kicking off as as an introduction to this conversation jeff on several occasions you've in our conversations, you said how we are all still influenced, for better or for worse, by the Kantian um, dualism that was uh, set up uh, predominantly in his uh, a critique of pure reason. Do you want to do you want to unpack that a little bit? Lord and God, uh, <laughs> yes. I'll, I'll and... come back in an hour and a half when it's time to go. <laughs> <laughs> yes and no. Um, uh, I think the second part of uh, of what we'll be looking at, the basic epistemological question in Kant, is uh, deals um, in a in a particularly potent way with this. I struggled with it a little bit, and we can talk about that when we get to it. Yeah, it had to do with the language, but um, but let's say that where all of our institutions are in, are um, embroiled and entrained in this duality that is falsely set up as a dichotomy and it's dichotomous in many places early on in in um in its established um concretization of that duality say and so um so if you were 
raised in a public school in the United States, then you are a thoroughgoing Kantian. There's, there's just no way around it. You are trained to be so. Um, and so um, it's very important to untangle ourselves from that, just like it's un, uh, important to untangle ourselves from some of the some of the um, almost religious presuppositions of psychology as we as we wrestled with during the yeah. six part series last time. And uh, that's been part of my destiny of my life is to to and, and to um, disentangle myself from the prejudices of of uh, this truncated ontology that that comes out of human Kant, but especially Kant because he, he makes abstract metaphysics and he makes abstract knowledge uh, at once while trying to save the metaphysical. Uh, yeah. Right. So, yeah. so it's in our religion, it's in our psychology, it's in our, it's in our um, material science in which we are now basing our moral ground upon, um, oddly enough. Does that answer your question? It, it certainly does. Um, I think it's also healthy to uh, to talk about the ways in which Kant was a huge leap forward to the thinking of, of his day, because um, we'll talk about it being a flawed attempt. It's like at a later stage. But the, the attempt was to actually um, to rid thinking of dogmatic thinking. Um, which has got to be a good this this uh, this this old notion of like through pure reason itself it's like being able to deduce the fun deduce the fundamental principles of life the universe and everything um and in that sense it's been hugely important in uh, <laughs> It's been a, it it was a huge step forward in uh, disabusing humanity of this this idea that we can we can know everything without looking at nature. <laughs> but basically, uh, if um, perhaps one way of describing it or, or, or key parts of pre-Kantian thinking was like we can just do speculative thinking, um, and that's enough to to ensure it's like a correct understanding of the world and Kant saying so like no 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 we can't we can't do this and and he's um he, he so he wants to create a non-dogmatic uh thinking uh, a non-dogmatic understanding of the world based based in experience um, which is like the synthetic part. It's like so that we can add knowledge so through through seeing things. Um, but at the same time, um, he's also having to contend with Hume, who's uh, basically at this stage contending that like all the thinking is just uh, it, it's a mishmash of um, uh, it's a mishmash of uh, memories and repetitive experiences that have been coalesced into the mind, but we can never talk in human hum, human terms. We can never talk about real knowledge of the world, and this is what Kant was trying to get away from. Here, so like he he was he was see, he was seized by the the beauty of mathematics in the sense that it created this absolute certainty of self my own confidence in my thinking to resolve certain types of questions i didn't have to appeal to a higher authority on this it's like through my own individual capacities and this is already beginning to sound a little bit 50 and that's not my intention but this is also part of what's going on in kant he's trying to rescue the human being from uh human philosophy which basically relegates it to an, an animal um incapable of anything other than just like grunting and moaning and uh, at, at the world and so like creating a language around it um and th there's there's more of those that we'll we'll come back to but those are a couple of areas in which he is so like particularly important in the world of uh, philosophy rescuing us from 
um, uh, from from humanism, humanism. Yes, I, I that's well said, and it's really important to give Kant his due. Um, but his but it but his uh, his his library book is overdue, so we need to we that's need to right. Cancel, yeah. the, cancel the membership and undo the the issues that have extrapolated out of the abstractions that he started with as dogmatic philosophy as he continued dogmatic philosophy in an unexamined way right so so i i, I agree um the 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 problem also is as i've mentioned before and in this case is relevant to what you were saying is that they're um they're like abbott and costello that routine um who's on first right i know that one yeah. uh it's really funny um, uh -huh. It's really, really, really funny, and it's it's a sort of uh, leftover of, of vaudeville routine um, that made it into you know picture shows, as they say. Mm -hmm. And it's basically just a um, uh, it's sort of a, a like a nominalism uh, uh, kind of routine where where um, the names of the people are who, what, and where, and one person is saying who is on first, and the other was going, I don't know. <laughs> Why do you keep saying that? This sort of thing, right? And so we ended up with this, uh, with these two uh, performative, you now to, to make it more serious, two performative um, actions that need each other in this weirdly conflictual, self-contradictory and almost fetishy kind of way that has mm. instituted itself, right? So, <clears throat> so, you know, there's this Humean um, coarse empiricism that, uh, that has us locked out of reality um, from the perspective of subject and object, and then um, and then we have this uh, thing inserted between subject and an ob object as the reality, which is the thing in itself. And on the other hand, a metaphysical reality of the synthetical judgment, this the set of, the synthetical I a priori um, judgment, which is a question for Kant of, of metaphysics. So he takes yeah. it almost like that metaphysics is a fact, but it can't be experienced. So he not only uh, uh, limits experience of uh, of direct knowledge uh, as an experience, he also limits uh, the ontological experience of the metaphysical, yeah. which, as we know, is thinking. That's, yeah, and he's it is it's this it's this attempt which uh, which he fails with uh, ultimately, isn't it? It's, it is that this attempt to save human thinking, and I, I think it's really worth it's, it's in chapter three, isn't it, of philosophy of freedom, where this this regaining the confidence in thinking because this is one of the things that's got lost. It's like through through hume and uh, the thinkers following in the streams like we if everything is just a subjective uh, grunting and moaning um then it's like wh where is the human being uh in this um and 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 tr thinking itself was was a was a, a victim of what happened there um so and so he's trying to fix that but he doesn't, as you rightly said, he goes on to create this metaphysical reality, which is, is inaccessible to us. So he, he, he excludes like vast realms of the human experience so that he can save the certainty of mathematics and science, which actually, when we look into it a little bit deeper, we'll see even there, this is like hugely problematic. Um, I love this. I love where we are right now because this is accessible to people, right? And we're talking about co complicated and complex philosophical, philosophical ideas and language. And Steiner's very academic in this. In this, you can see why he was a shooting star within that within that uh, world at the time. Mm. Um, but uh, in the preface, where he starts with um, uh, basically yeah. the world is suffering an unhealthy faith in Kant. Um, he takes down the notion and makes a claim, basically, uh, that this book is uh, is based on, which is that um, <clears throat> the object the object of knowledge is to represent something that already exists, right? And, <laughs> right. That's where it seems obvious. Like, oh yeah, that's right. 
that's a that's one of those things the new atheists do. They make that little move where they say, "Well, we have to start with a blunt truth. We have to start with a blunt starting point." There's, there's just there's a that's a black that's a black backdrop that we yeah. have to start at because you can't get behind that one, right? Well, as we know, you can get behind it because thinking is transparent to itself in its in its epistemological procedural sequences. Yeah. Um, and it and on the other hand, Steiner says basically we transform what we're do what we're doing with knowledge is creating something new we're part yeah. of the creation of the evolutionary in the in the, in the evolutionary sense of of uh of existence right so that's a that's a pretty big claim on one hand and it's also from a small individual uh point of view it's 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 undeniable there's just no way around it <clears throat> yeah. so just so I'm going to give us like a very brief overview of the preface introduction, preliminary remarks, and then we'll go into chapter two. But um, vastly simplifies, vastly simplifying so those those few pages um, of the text. Uh, he's 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 arguing that uh, Kant tried to uh, overcome dogmatic philosophy. Um, he failed to do that because he unconsciously uh, um, uh, kept certain parts of dogmatic philosophy in there. He created a new world of problems in the division that he set up in his system. And the most serious error is that he tried to create an epistemology, a theory of knowledge um, on this dogmatic philosophy and an epistemology, a theory of knowing, has to be at its roots unconditional. You can't make um, you can't make statements about um, about the value of knowledge from within that system itself. It has to be done from uh, it's like an outside of knowledge itself, um, which sounds difficult to um to unpack but i think we'll certainly manage to have a go and we'll we'll come back to this several times because in chapter four of this book where he talks about a new starting point we'll go into um into more depth in this unconditionality which is a a really important uh concept to to understand friends of plotinus will uh, will recognize unconditionality uh, there um yeah. But anything else that you think was in the preface or introduction that I haven't mentioned? No, I think it. I think it's recapitulated. Um, it's a great read, though, and I really suggest that. Yeah. The the, the preface and introduction. Um, is it is it there where he talks about the idealists, the German idealists, or is it, or is it? Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, that's right. Where, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is really important because. Because he utilizes the German idealist to say, I mean, you were mentioning Fichte earlier, and it, and you were sounding like like you were uh, Fichteizing um, <laughs> Kant, right? Where, in actuality, as uh, as as the scholar Frederick Amrine describes in his um, in his talks around his book, "Kicking Away the Ladder," um, uh, um, Fichte was on fire with Kant. All of them were. Like he yes, had right, given yeah. them, like what you were talking about, um, all of those German idealists were on fire uh, when you were when you were uh, mentioning um, uh, what Kant brought. Something he brought something new um, in this in this in the Steinerian sense of what I was just saying as relates to how we transform the world. He sure transformed the world, you know, and in some ways without in in some ways challenging us, let's say, for to think about consequentiality. Uh, and and if our epistemology isn't uh, uh, transparent at, from the beginning and and, and uh, empty of presupposition and prejudice, then we're 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 inevitably not going to be able to see the consequences. We're, we're we've sabotaged ourselves in relationship to that. But the German I, I, idealists, I, I just just to finish that thought, the German idealists really tried to solve this these problems and were given license to do so. Uh, Hegel. And Fichte, particularly uh, in their in their directions, um, uh, and 
and the but the real star there of course was goethe as we know because he actually practiced the uh bridging of the subject object um uh fallacy say hmm. and um and then 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 hegel takes the the, the uh, goethe's metamorphosis of plants and um, lays it out as a, as a mind structure for the, for the phenomenology of spirit, which uh, which which uh, which uh, Steiner critiques uh, the title by suggesting it should be a phenomenology of consciousness, not a phenomenology of spirit. So yeah, I mean, there that's an important factor in the in this book yeah. because because Steiner's metamorphosing in a certain sense, in a Goethean sense. The, the the organic thought that comes from getting to the epistemology in the way that the the, the idealist didn't quite get to but the fit in a certain sense achieved with an existential uh, relationship with thinking in the in this in the I experience something like that yeah so, so I'm not sure see if you agree with me in this uh, with this uh, this idea so I mean these these geniuses uh, Schlegel, Hegel, Fichte, uh, Schopenhauer, uh, and all of these people, they all are wildly enthusiastic about certain parts of Kant, yet actually their own systems are a rebellion against some of the, like, the consequences of that way of thinking. But I think I am correct in saying, and you might be able to help me with this, that but they don't actually kick the ladder away because they still like live within this um, subjective, uh, this subjective, I can only know um, myself world. Uh, that that is still, they don't tackle this fundamental problem head on. They 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 like ignore it and i think there's one part in in the introduction or the preliminary remarks where he talks about so like Volkelt, for example it's like Volkelt, he so, says basically we can't agree with uh kant on this but nevertheless we'll uh, so it's, there's problems when we look at synthetic and apr we say there's problems with this there's problems all over the place but never mind we'll accept that is that is that how you read it as well it is and it's the humian uh crypto humian smuggling going on there because um um well not it's the reaction it's the it's the it's the dichotomy there because you have uh well we don't have real empiricism here right mm -hmm. right which goethe did the subtle empiricism and steiner's work is based on an, an empiricism in multi dimensions right so and, and so these so the truths that you pull out from steiner are conciliant in, in all the dimensions physical soul spirit just to sort of coarsely describe it um so um so what you have is rationale and so you can see why these two things if the if the empiricism remains coarse the ontology truncated and the rationale is the only thing that you have and so this sort of new religion becomes the the way you can um uh, uh provide a um uh, an excuse for the things that you're 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 uh, axiomatically um, smuggling into your to your uh, narrative, say. So that's my way of saying, yeah, that's mm -hmm. exactly right. That's the way I see it as well, right? And and um, who somebody said, oh, it was Amrine said uh, um, that you know our uh, Owen Barfield wrote the book, uh, um, Romanticism Comes of Age, mm -hmm. and it was very much about the German idealists as well, you know, it wasn't like Stendhal and, um, you know, these, these flowery, um, 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 poetic novelists. It was, it was really about, uh, Coleridge and, um, um, and the German idealists and Goethe. Uh, so, so the idea that, um, that idealism needs to come of age, uh, is is it is right there, and that's what this is what Steiner does. This brings idealism into the modern age. And, and somebody like, for example, Verveke, in his um, his his um, examination of the meaning crisis, fifty some hours of that, uh, when he's dealing with Barfield, struggles with this because Barfield seems to be 
promoting the romantics. And this is exactly where people have problem with the romantics is that they've subjectivized everything to the point of uh, a sort of florid uh, self-absorption, say. And that's not romanticism in the, in the, um, in the Coleridgean or in the Goethean sense at all. Yeah, good point. Now to um, build, build a little bit on um, <clears throat> specifically Hegel, who you were mentioning earlier, how he's directly related to the title of this book. And I want to go a little bit further than that as well. So this isn't actually from in the book here, but when I was doing my homework on, on Kant, I was looking at antimonies, uh, basically uh, it's like irreconcilable uh, uh, theories of uh, or um, uh, of what reality is, and antimonies is the term that uh, Kant uses for them, and basically Kant is using it to describe the limits of reason, and this is a really important. Uh, question and I'm just going to try and like skim the surface of it because there, there's a lot here. So, at one level, this is one of the ideas that Hegel takes up um, because he is about if it, like these two these antimonies in Hegelian speak become thesis antithesis and Hegel is like uh, sublimes these into so like a, a, a new thesis. And so on so you've got this this process so this is quite this is one of these really interesting ways in which kant has um been the uh been the source of like an amazing thinking in in the case of hegel here but this 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 idea that reason is um incapable of uh resolving certain antimonies, thesis, antithesis, I think is really interesting. And I'm beginning to see it in the light of the difference between the period of the intellectual soul and the period of the consciousness soul into which we, for, in which we've been living for the last uh, four or five hundred years, or five, six hundred, actually, isn't it? Um, so what do I mean by that? That there is this idea um, that if, if we ask ourselves the question, what is the consciousness soul? It is, it is where we begin to have, we are conscious of being spiritual beings. And as spiritual beings, we know the full truth. And obviously this is a process for us, but being a, a spiritual being means being in contact with the truth and the intellectual uh, soul phase that we are living with the fruits of them in Kant here we see a reflection of how the, the the intellectualizing of understanding the world is a vital part in creating that sense of security of uh, a sense of certainty of individual existence but at its core it's flawed because there are certain questions that it cannot resolve and I, i'm beginning to see kant as one of the forerunners of pointing out like it's the, the the experience of humanity since the greeks where the intellectual soul is is nurtured and through the dark ages and into the into the middle ages that this complete trust in in reason that was given it's like one of the essential points of medieval thinking or an not one of the uh, so an essential part of uh medieval thinking kant is calling this into question and this is symptomatic of what the consciousness soul has to do i'm not interested in limited truths it's the truth and the more I mean, we could, if I just sketch a little bit, there's this, this, this idea that's like even the, the extent to which we awaken 
consciousness of our own spiritual essence in us and how that affects us it's like as we move through there's the kama loka uh, lower dimension and higher dimension these are all essential aspects of the path that the whole of humanity is on and kant is one of the people that's getting people to wake up to no yeah reason's good or is that the intellect is important intellect is hugely important but it's not the be all and end all humanity has to move through this to a, a conscious awareness of its own individual spiritual uh, nature um and it was uh, yes so um it's, it's helpful seeing it also in that context that kant was in that sense he was like uh, given to us by the spiritual world as part of this evolution of the uh, consciousness so yeah that's really well framed i would say that's so helpful that steiner brought this notion of evolution of consciousness and then all, and articulated the actual um uh soul phenomena and in, in body say so the the structures in the soul that that because we still I mean, we're living in an age where we're, we're, we're regressing in some respects. The whole new atheism movement is a regression into a, 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 a uh, neo-enlightenment uh, redo, you know, sort of, oh, those were the days, you know, um, a sort of nostalgia, an intellectual nostalgia, and this sort of locks you into this uh, a non-phenomenological approach to the subtle realities that the consciousness soul is experiencing. And clearly Kant was experiencing the, yeah. the spiritual, like he, he was certainly having a sacred experience when he was, but it didn't flow into his work because he didn't have a, a, and an, an, he didn't have, he didn't have the, the, the empirical relationship with it, say, or, or know to do that, or, or the consciousness of the time didn't allow for it perhaps except in goethe who's this amazing exception right <clears throat> well i mean even goethe you could argue he did it um um he did it not using critical thinking because this is the one another one of these important aspects is that this this is where kant and steiner are on similar territory it's using it's using thinking to understand the world goethe goethe was something uh, it was um so he he he, he what's, the, what's this saying that goethe said one of the things i'm proud about is i've never thought about thinking is, is, is um and this is a reflection of the fact that he worked in a positive sense instinctively out of his own fundamental understandings but he didn't bring his process uh or he didn't submit it to critical thinking the fact that it was healthy led to all the the the, the uh, and based in truth if we put it like that that was like that was that was the real value of the work kant was involved with another project which steiner then developed which is understanding through the faculty of thinking what is actually happening there yeah two things um mm -hmm. i agree with that uh, uh goethe was remarkably unselfconscious at the level of his own epistemology say yet he redefined epistemology as we yeah. know it through steiner right yeah. and so uh so i would say that what what goethe was um in a um not a child right <laughs> like he he self-reflected he argued he had the you know the, the the famous conflict with schiller who didn't quite understand what what he was getting yeah. at and what a friend you know to draw it out even though Schiller thought he was right at first, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, so what what Goethe did was was he didn't presuppose thinking to be um, to be uh, reducible to what Kant reduces it to in the critique of pure reason. A pure reason is 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 the thinking we know as we as Steiner describes it in Philosophy of Freedom. Whereas Kant sort of truncates even thinking itself into this more yeah. intellectual soul picture, which is why I guess right that the that that the dogma of the intellectual soul period was carried forth into the consciousness soul period because because he he compartmentalized he categorized uh, intellectual thinking as thinking which it's not. Mm -hmm.
you know, it's an aftermath of thinking an artifact or, or an, a continuation, say, or something like that. Yeah. So, and the other thing I wanted to mention is when you were talking about um, um, the way Kant exploded the, the, the previous way of thinking about things and um, set the, set, set, ficked his hair on fire. A lot of people who trace postmodernism and its subjective um, relativism uh, to Kant um, yeah. as sort of the progenitor of that. And so a, lo a lot is laid at Kant's feet for sure. <laughs> but I don't think it's, I, I, in my humble opinion, I, I don't think it's, it's possible to fully critique Kant without doing what you're doing, which is giving him credit and putting him in context, but also without, um, without just criticizing, um, um, or without just manifesting one narrative like postmodernism, right? It, it's a, it's a plethora of narratives because postmodernism is against the grand narrative that he wished to save. Right. So, so I think it's important that we, well, this is another way in which we need to, to, to do this work at this very nadir point in order to untangle ourselves from this hot mess we find ourselves in. Yeah. A, a, a Western world that's at war with itself. A, a final thought before we, for, at least for me, you might want to reflect on it. Um, a final thought before we actually dig into the details of uh, chapter two there. So I mentioned before why I'm going to, for myself, insist on it being truth and science, because in those two words, I feel reflected this idea of the difference between consciousness, soul, truth, science, so like what is arrived at through reason and the empirical um, process um, th that I see just in those choice choice of words, whether or not this is what Steiner was thinking, but I see just in those two words a reflection of this intellectual mo moving to consciousness, soul, um, uh, yeah. You just went mute. So unpack that a little bit because with, there's a there are two there are two things I'd like to for mm -hmm. you to make clear to people who are watching who don't understand who who don't understand uh, who have no access to understand what it is you're saying here. Okay. Um, because yeah. I think it's really important. Um, uh, but first of all, I want to get the first thing is to understand what you just said. Are you were saying you you want to to distinguish the title or the, the subject as truth and science, because truth is a consciousness soul experience and, and science is an intellectual soul experience. You are. Okay. And so then, uh, so in, then the, in the, in the current way, we understand science, not I see, spiritual I see, science. I see. Yeah. A, so there's a, a priori critique and <laughs> your retitling of the book it's good yeah. i like it i like it I, I, I liked it from the beginning as i mentioned um uh then i have a third thing because it's a there's a question that arises but do unpack for people watching okay uh what the difference between intellectual soul is and consciousness soul or what consciousness soul is and what intellectual soul i think you you touched on that phenomenologically and in, in sort of uh, something that's something people can grasp with the idea of the spirit and the consciousness soul. But <clears throat> so one of the one of the fruits of the period of the intellectual soul, something that wasn't available to humanity before, was this ability to it's like cut up nature, intellectualize it, it's like using using reason to like to make certain uh, deductions about or synthetic uh, statements about nature purely using this faculty of reason so observing nature and um and then being able to uh, deduce so like new facts synthetic facts from those observations and and in that way vastly increasing so like our knowledge of of the world of um indescribable value to humanity on, on multiple levels and one of the areas that i focused on was this is this is an individual activity 
and therefore is a it's like a, a self a, um awareness of self strengthening activity which is key in, in in this process however this cutting up and intellectualizing of nature is at its heart it um it's conflicted and this was reflected in Kant talking about antimonies and Hegel talking about a thesis and antithesis there are certain questions uh certain uh, contradictions apparent contradictions about the nature of reality that become irresolvable uh to this I, I'll see if I can get up a couple I've made some notes on this so uh Kant talks about um hmm, where did i put those um there were four of them i had there uh, there are four antimonies like presented by kant in his uh, critique of pure reason which he gives as evidence of how reason is no never going to be able to give us the whole truth a recognition of something that's like essential about the intellectual soul state that we've or period that we've moved through. And so this is this is the scientific way of understanding the world. It's like picking it apart and like trying to put it together. But Kant is saying so like ultimately, uh, once we get to uh, let's call them non-empirical levels then reason can't cut it anymore so it can't tackle the problems of determinism versus freedom it can't tackle uh the, the uh, questions about the divine it can't tackle i wish i could find that uh, the list that i made where did i put them um I, when you comment i'll have i'll have a look on them so this is the science part the uh, intellectual soul part that I am linking to the word science in the title. The consciousness soul part is the, the truth part that the, the essential thrust of consciousness soul as we wake up ever increasingly to being spiritual beings, this leads us um, into realms where uh, those apparent those those um those antimonies those theses antitheses that are irreconcilable for normal reason scientific reason they become reconcilable and that's what the truth is it's 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 this hegelian process antithesis thesis sublimation um, and, and then we've then we got it. And did, did that help to oh, clarify? Oh, that's beautiful. That's just beautiful. I just that that finish there that was gorgeous because it's that's Gertian. That's a Gertian um, empiricism of the soul life, right? So the only thing I would add is, um, um, well, first of all, I'd say the, what's beautiful about it is it is it provides the perspective on on a reality that seems divided when you're. When you're in a state of consciousness that 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 is that is a reality, but only a one dimension of reality, and then you step back one, and you have an evolution of consciousness, which sort of proves it's a sort of proof of concept of the of of the evolution of consciousness and development, because a twelve year old is firmly ensconced in the in the intellectual soul period. I can tell you that <laughs> my daughter uh, is. Uh, is quite the theorizer of um, um, zany ideas uh, as fact. So, um, uh, but but so having brought it to the individual, I think there's a further explanation that one could offer that has to do with the phenomenology of the individual psyche and the relationship. Uh, what, what is there? And so, I, I want to offer a theory, uh, mm -hmm. my new relationship with theory. <laughs> um, in studying the seven life processes. Steiner describes uh, this. This is where <clears throat> this came from. It was inspired by, say, Steiner describes. <clears throat> excuse me. Describes uh, the sentient um, body as the scabbard for the for the sort of 
sword of the sentient soul sort of it's in the sentient souls and sheathed inside the sentient body mm -hmm. and what occurred to me is that if that's the case then the other soul config consciousnesses must have bodies too and this was also inspired by lorenzo in our conversation um a, a couple of uh iterations ago on the on the um earth phenomenon group because uh because he was saying where are the bodies because in a sense you have to uh know where the bodies are uh or locate a body for something to have a real phenomenological sensibility and intelligibility mm -hmm. and uh both of those things to understand it and for it its relationship to the world to be a real one and not abstract and I, and so what i really thought was well then the, then the, then the intellectual soul has a body and i think it's what we call the knowledge body which is why it's important to say we don't go when we when we evolve the consciousness soul as individuals or a society we don't leave the intellectual soul behind it's still yeah. so much part of who we are uh, it just gets it itself gets transformed or metamorphoses into the consciousness soul but it also remains isomorphically true in a certain sense and it's usable and we'll see in steiner at the end of this uh session that that uh at the end of the chapter two as you're calling it um uh he deals with the importance of the analytical in in philosophy um uh as a tool say and that yeah. and the analytical is what you're describing is the intellectual soul consciousness right it's it's what ian mcgilchrist calls the is it, I always forget the left brain, right brain. And now I'm not familiar enough either. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, it's it's one of it's the it's the it's the analytical. Brain. I think it'd be the right. I think be the left brain because it's the right hand. I think. Yes, drawing on okay. the right side of the brain was one of the. Yes, yeah, <laughs> so it's a left brain uh, dominance that that is our inability to move into the consciousness soul, which is the right brain um, integration, say of both. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. So should we dig into this uh, synthetic a priori, a priori, a priori uh, judgments or knowledge? Are we are we ready to go there? Yeah, we think? are, but I wanted to. Uh, there was one that third thing, which was oh, so <clears throat> which was truth and knowledge, truth versus knowledge, uh, and uh, it seems to me that that's where uh, where in our previous series uh, did our our friends got got tripped up is the is n not being able to distinguish between truth and knowledge in the is ought question right because mm -hmm. wherever there's truth there's knowledge uh truth without knowledge without truth is what you're calling um the the uh partial truths of of the intellectual, the intellectual soul. soul consciousness that we are nostalgically regressing into yeah, yeah. okay good awesome cool uh yeah how should we how should we tackle uh this bit perhaps um so in in chapter two we're, we're going to be talking about kant's fundamental question concerning epistemology is how are synthetical judgments a priori possible so if i if i start there and uh and now my screen's just gone all completely loopy and i don't know why there we go um if i start there and then you when i when i frazzle and <laughs> crash and burn uh, you can save me um so you've got uh let's start with the synthetical analytical what's going on there um there's this idea in in philosophy um specifically in the field of language you've got uh, knowledge from two sources you can have uh knowledge that is inherent to something and the example that's always given in the textbooks is so like um if 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 i know that person's a, if that person is a bachelor then i know that he's unmarried because that's the definition of a bachelor okay so analytical statements are where you've got something and that's like inherent in that idea are other ideas which you can also deduce from from that statement 
Um, and that's not so important here. Um, the important part is Kant's interested in how we can have slight knowledge about the world, how we can have new knowledge, and that's why synthetic, uh, uh, synthetic knowledge is important, because synthetic statements are one where I can, with justification, using reason, if I can say that one, th one thing is true and therefore something else is true, and my mind has just done uh it's just gone into freeze moment so i can't actually think of the example that i need to think about to give an example there but perhaps you can help me out uh, what was the classic example of that otherwise i'm going to have to consult my um a, a documents <laughs> you're going to have to consult your documents my mind went into a freeze moment too Okay, uh, it is raining outside is a synthetic judgment because uh, it's like the fact that it's outside uh, doesn't automatically, inherent in the word outside is not the idea that it's raining, but it's nevertheless a true statement. Okay, so I've put two ideas together and, and they, they are true, but that one isn't inherent in the other. So we stick with raining and bachelors there. In the, in the field of epistemology, theory of knowledge, you've got a similar division of things being inherent, bachelor, or things being synthetic, uh, reigning. And in the field of epistemology, a priori statements are ones that are given by the nature of what they are. Inherent in them is uh, the idea. So you're not adding one piece of information to another piece of information to arrive at a greater understanding of the situation uh, is it, they're, they're inbuilt and a a posteriori uh, are uh, similar to synthetic statements and this is the process of science where you win knowledge by making observations about science and then putting putting two and two together to um, to arrive at new knowledge and th so this is where he starts off chapter two saying this is an essential part of Kant's thinking because he wants to he wants to defend he wants to make mathematical knowledge valid non-human it is a value it tells us something about the world and also science he wants to make that also a truth rather than just a brain fart that uh, that Hume thinks that they are <laughs> well, first of all, uh, the, no, the now that the, the I cannot let this pass. That was and and um, it's raining bachelors, which makes me think of the Weather Girls song. It's raining men. <laughs> so, are both of those things true? It's raining, and it is a bachelor's falling from the sky. Uh, in a certain sort of sense, the Weather Girls thought that would be an ideal experience if that were the case. Uh, yeah. But if cows could fly, as they say, okay, we're being silly. Um, yes, well said. Well, that's that's a clear outline of the of the the point. Uh, so he gets to this point where he he describes what well, he actually says. Kant himself says uh, that it's a metaphysical question, right? And sort of he sort of sets that aside, sort of sneakily, doesn't he? Sort of. Uh, um, well, let's dig in. Let's dig into yeah. that because I've also been discovering some in interesting stuff. So don't don't skip over that because there's lots to chew through there. Yeah, no, that's all I was going to point out. So so what he says is <clears throat> basically that that mathematics is one of these um, um, a priori realities. He, 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 they they are synthetic truths. Right. These, Synthetical um, truths, yes. Yeah, and this yeah. already just there. Uh, Steiner it's like talks about was it uh, Remke that talks about how mm. yes mm, Remke. how about how these are insufficient? But I've been doing a little bit of digging there because um, there there is a uh, there is a field of I don't know if you could call it a field of uh, mathematics, but. There's something called ethnomathematics, and what is that? It's basically uh, platonic mathematics. Okay, so okay, what is that? 
it's the idea that um, that this this notion that mathematics is always synthetic, which is the point that uh, Kant is uh, makes but fails to defend, is actually radically challenged by mathematical Platonists who would argue that no. Uh, and I'm going to le read read a little bit here because so I get it right, but. It reminds me a little bit of the, what you described with your son several weeks ago about the nature of numbers. Because uh, so a synthetic mathematist, somebody defending the synthetic um, uh, position, uh, would say that two plus two is four. So like we've got two, we've got another two, and we've, we've created a new truth, which is the four. And the whole thing is so like all packaged together, so it is a truth. Um, but there is actually the other perspective, and this might actually get mentioned later in the book. I know I've seen it in, in some type of literature recently, but actually that isn't the only way of looking at it. Four is the whole out of which two and two are the inherent properties, i.e. it's an analytical statement. And if you ask... If you ask people whether mathematics is synthetic, they will usually say, yes, it's about creating new truths, two plus two is four. But actually, there's a whole branch of mathematics, this mathematical Platonism, which I'm going to just see if I can find it. Uh, this, this brought up a whole new area of uh, interest for me. So we've got this two plus two is four is uh, is going on. But in this in this world um you've got some really interesting people like kurt gödel it's like the theory of incompleteness theorem these radical ideas which have also shaken the mathematical world so that it has to revise its own assumptions of truth mathematics prior to gödel believed that it was uh so all of its axioms were provable within the realm of mathematics itself. And Gödel came along and said, eh, eh, you're wrong there. And why this is important in this conversation, um, it, it, and if anybody watching this video feels that I've like misspoken there, I would really like to, to, uh, to, to, to hear that uh, criticism. But my understanding is Gödel says, like, you guys, you're mis uh, mistaken that... Um, you cannot, uh, so like mathematics cannot, is axioms are not self-supporting. They require a, something outside the system to create their justification. We will see this repeat, repeated in Spickler, or Spicker, Gideon Spicker, I think in chapter three or four of this book, this, this idea to do with logic. Um, so I'm getting, because I mentioned so many ideas now, I've got lost with the point that I wanted to make. Anyway, so Gödel is really interesting here because he's pointing out that um, he's he's coming from this Platonic view, which is the opposite of a justification for the synthetic. It's an argument for the analytical view. And Steiner doesn't mention Gödel because Gödel wasn't, I don't think he was even alive. He certainly hadn't created his, written his theory of incompleteness at that stage. Um, but he does list other authors who, no, in actual fact, he doesn't, on that particular one, I'm not sure he does. Do you remember whether he does, uh, um, Jeff? I don't does think he so. Actually talk, he, I know he talks about, uh, 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 he talks about Renke and he talks about Otto Liebmann, who we know from the philosophy of, um, the, the riddles of philosophy, but, um, now, perhaps he doesn't actually specifically make Zimmerman. There's a guy called Zimmerman who so like, refutes uh, this this ideas. I didn't actually find out what Zimmerman's um, arguments against them being synthetical were, but um, anyway. Uh, so that was a, that was a lot there, but I did want to jump in on that point so that we didn't miss that. So like synthetic is an important concept to understand, and 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 why it's is understand important. It's really important because we're educating our children um, in the synthetical presupposition of of uh, a, a truncated reality, say, 
mm -hmm. mathematics in the conventional intellectual soul sense is an example of that. So this is the, the point. This is why we're doing this. And for me, is, the, the, is to disentangle ourselves from these pre presuppositions so we're not educating our children to be um, confused about reality because reality is not very friendly when you're when you're when you're working against it. So uh, you mentioned my son, and this is exactly why he came to this conclusion through the way uh, an eight year old has learned mathematics in first and second grade, because they learn the whole and then um, they, they experience the whole because they're doing pattern recognition. And this is one way to is one cognitive science way to put it, which is actually yeah. to look in the etheric, into the etheric world from the from the soul body and so they they'll look at a grouping and that's one thing it's not a bunch of it's not a, a sum of its parts it's one thing and then you pull it apart and you see the way in which it's all connected right so you never lose the connectivity so he's he's not losing there's two streams there he's not losing the connectivity with the uh, um spiritual reality that he came into this life with on one hand and yeah. he's not losing the connectivity with the world around him that he's orienting to so he's not alienated from the world around him this is why it's important this is why these questions i mean we can be you know mathematics is abstract and and can be abstract and it means a lot to some people and and uh, uh unfortunately it means almost nothing to me because of the way it was taught right it's important. It's very clarifying, and uh, and he's he was clear on that issue, that he is older than I am, because the world is older when he when he, and the world is a whole, right? So yeah, it's really important, and it's real. So we're talking about not uh, these aren't abstractions. This is child development we're talking about, and what we're doing to children just simply through through teaching math from as a as the as the whole is just a sum of its parts. So you're just a speck of dust in the in the material landscape, son. I've, I managed to find a bit that I actually wanted to read. Just again, I think it's important to 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 share these ideas. So, what is mathematical Platonism? Um, so it posits the existence of abstract mathematical objects. So you can already begin to hear the Platonic idea: abstract mathematical objects including numbers as independent entities that have a reality of their own according to this viewpoint mathematical truths are discovered rather than invented um and this is really interesting you talk to mathematicians and they talk about mathematics being it's like a a, a a, a, a truth or an invention it's not it's a language to describe reality which reality does it describe it describes the physical reality um, you, it's amazing to uh, competent mathemat mathematicians who fail to understand that that mathematics is a language. It's not a truth. It's a language for describing. And this point comes up a little bit later as well, so we'll come back to it. Okay. Uh, discovered rather than invented. And mathematical statements correspond to the properties and relationships of these abstract mathematical entities. Platonists argue that mathematical objects exist outside of human thought and are not merely constructs of our minds or products of language. Um, and, and so uh, the, the bit that we would, um, this part, that last sentence is really interesting because we would agree with it to 50%, I think. So I'll just reread it. Platonists argue that mathematical objects exist outside of human thought and are not merely constructs of the mind or products of language. Would you like to comment on that or shall I? At first. Yeah. Yeah. With, with the, the uh, relationless aggregate. Um, that's, the, that's the way we are. This is the, it's the way our consciousness at this time experiences the world. And the problem with Kant and Hume but Kant particularly that we're talking about is that is that he concretized that unintentionally yeah. that that would would it would divisionized 
the division that we would be uh, in the subject object duality with the world in the in the in the subject is yeah so and then we've talked about that and then so metaphysics is i mean um uh mathematics is rooted in some metaphysical reality that can't even be discovered say can't but can't be experienced so this is where this is where steiner says um even even things that seem mathematically obvious have to be experienced at some point or or that they just they're nothing they're shimmera you know it's just like why why would it mean anything to me it reminds me of what of the way in which john was describing in the previous series how he taught mathematics and how in um plato um uh uh i, I forget it was a, a slave boy who was who had not been educated was taught mathematics through through um, relevant exper experiential exp um, um, uh, grasp for the child, and then and then learns complicated. Uh, uh, I forget it was geometrical figures. I'm not quite sure. John, you, okay, yeah, I'm, yeah, I, I, mean, I can't remember that, but so, uh, okay, so. A priori, a synthetic and a priori, we've we've talked at and how he puts these together and basically that synthetic judgments are important because they enhance knowledge, but mathematics isn't synthetic. That's one aspect of the problem. A priori knowledge is um th this is this is the other area that's uh, that's problematic um in here because what he's saying is that it's only true if it's a priori which excludes empiricism excludes like the senses in there so the he he tries to resolve hume by putting these two together and even it's like the, the statements he makes are hugely problematic so he's creating a um <laughs> He, he's floating on air in the sense that he hasn't got a firm foundation for his for his questions, um, which leads to so like the final criticism of uh, of Steiner in this in this chapter, which is that um, an epistemology. Uh, remember, Kant's Kant's intention was to create an a non-dogmatic epistemology but he, he he fails in that um he fails in that project and this is the biggest problem the one that this book is going to be select so trying to try to resolve that not only does he so he makes he, he smuggles in dogmatism into his epistemology um, and breaks the essential rule of epistemology which i want us to dig into now that an epistemology has to be unconditional. Um, why why is that so important? In if you, um, Jeff, I know you've slightly thought about this question before. Why why is it so important that an epistemology is unconditional? Uh, well, it's, it's a plethora of reasons for that. Um, <clears throat> if knowledge is going to be sound, then your your um, way of knowing has to be transparent to you. If you're if you're pre if you're presupposing um, causes that you have no relationship with, um, whether it's pragmatically or or without with axiomatically um, not um, uh, unexamined, then then it's like what you talked about before. It's it's an aim problem because you're going to veer off. Uh, uh, you're going to increasingly veer off the path uh, as relates to what's real and what's true. Um, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the presuppositions are specifically important too because uh, there's the presupposition of knowledge and the presupposition of experience, right? That experience is inherently um, uh, subjective. That's in, in, inherently, in, well, and it is. 
<laughs> but that's important. That's yeah. it's important part of the epistem epistemological procedure. So what Steiner does, and, and I would say, it, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, <clears throat> nobody else has since and nobody did before, laid out the, 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 the uh, transparently laid out the process of by which we come to know things. And so why is that important? Because it it is the first reality. What does he say here? Um, that you have to have a, uh, uh, at first you have to have a didactic relationship with your epistemology. Meaning um, one has to be self-taught because one has to experience the arising out of which knowledge, uh, out of that which knowledge comes from. So, and then that's an experienceable reality, right? It's a, so and it doesn't truncate experience as somehow untrustworthy or, or unscientific or unmathematical, right? Or whatever, right? Yeah. We don't need the, the presuppositions if we're doing our epistemology right, which is why we can understand where, where specific fields in science are going wrong, right? Where biology is going wrong uh, in the medicalization of, of um, existence. But if, if, we've, if we're doing our epistemology, we're not going to get fooled. Yeah, we're not we're not building castles in the air. That was one of the pictures that I knew. I didn't end up using a slideshow, but for this one, but I was the, I, I had I, I found a, few, a couple of pictures as like castles in the air. And this is a topic that we talked about when we talked about uh, the philosophy of freedom as well. Um, that a a, a true epistemology cannot come with any presuppositions i.e it has to come from a point prior to thinking and there are, so i'm going to read a couple of bits from um from the second chapter that are relevant uh, to this point um so steiner mentions that volkelt uh, johannes volkelt uh, says uh, Kant starts from the positive assumption that a necessary and universal knowledge exists as an actual actual fact. You can't do that. That is already a statement of knowledge. And goes on to say, these presuppositions, which Kant never specifically attempted to prove, are so contrary to a proper critical theory of knowledge that one must seriously ask oneself whether the critique of pure reason is valid as critical epistemology. Uh, so I think that's key for what one of the a key point for understanding why uh, an epistemology has to be unconditional. And second point um, is this bit here. Uh, and, and this is where Steiner, he also does it here. This is where this prologue was really useful for me when we were doing the work on chapter three when uh when steiner brings in this idea of the relationless aggregate the given um so uh, and we in chapter four we will get to this but i want to highlight it now because it is important he says uh, in reply to these criticisms of Kant's critique of reason it could be said that every theory of knowledge must first lead the reader to where the starting point free of all pre presuppositions is to be found for what we possess as knowledge at any moment in our life is as far removed from this point and we must first be led back to it artificially and this is really important i'm thinking i'm thinking uh, conversations with the um the lost scrapbook here so that we had that it's not it's not about describing what this state was it's about leading us back to a state prior to thinking and i want to give an example of that as it's like a a fair i think a, an experience that people can relate to that is getting a little bit close to that so imagine you don't speak uh swedish OK, så jag skulle börja kunna börja prata nu om massvis med olika saker och du har inte förstått någonting. OK, Jeff, just give me a quick translation of that. Uh, Go on, say you don't know. That's the point is. <laughs> no, tell me you don't know. It's just a jumble of sounds, isn't it? 
That is all it is. And anybody of this can walk out of their door, they can turn on the radio, and they can experience this relationless aggregate immediately. Listen to a foreign language that you know nothing about. There was a slight risk that you actually picked up on one or two words because of it's like the, the similarities between Swedish and English, of which there are lots. Uh, so I was taking a little risk there, but so that's why I told you to shut up, so <laughs> in case you disproved my theory. But we could go to a, a language further away like Chinese, where you could be so like 99% certain that unless somebody had had direct experience of Asiatic languages or Chinese itself, then they wouldn't have the foggiest what they're talking about. And this is the point that we can actually artificially induce a moment where where we, we know what life was like prior to thinking. We cannot say anything about it. It's just it's just a relationless aggregate in this particular case of sounds. But the interesting thing is, is you could record that and then you could begin to sort of like unpack little bits of sound and compare it to other Swedish, Swedish, Swedish speakers in other different contexts. And eventually that universal thank thinking activity that is in life with you would begin to discover patterns it would break it down it would use the intellect break it down into little bits and then you would begin to map it to concepts that you are familiar with in english um so i don't wanted to say to people again here this this relationless aggregate some people think it's like some mystical state don't listen to them. Walk out the door, talk to somebody in a language that you don't understand, or have somebody speak to you in a language you don't understand. You, you've nearly got it there. But already that living experience, I assume that that person is actually saying something that has sense. That's what the thinking activity brings to the world. The world is full of sense and meaning. And that's an epistemology, it's like the true epistemology will take you back to that point. And then we begin to unpack how this activity of thinking is related to this knowledge creating process. Yes. Uh, yes. I really saw that when I was reading through this this time and um, in relationship to chapter three, because I didn't really get what lost scrapbook was after there now and now i understand and and hopefully he's watching and will um he might say he might give us a, a lengthy the... reply <laughs> <laughs> yeah right we'll see we'll see yeah um i hope so <clears throat> anyway i think of um two things um here um one is um that i struggled with the predicate subject um mm -hmm. language here and this is an example, a little example of of where the relationless aggregate is. I, I couldn't understand what he was saying because I couldn't understand if he was using uh, language about grammar. Right, because mm -hmm. predicate and subject are terms that we use uh, in uh, grammatically. And then also subject has two meanings, right? There's the subject yeah. and then yeah. there's subject matter, right? There's the subject matter, right? Uh, and they're related, but it takes unpacking, it takes it takes a uh, thinking to to relate them. And then if you're not particularly, uh, um, I'm uh, my wife would be very embarrassed for me to say this because she's an English teacher and very grammatically correct, uh, because she understands grammar in a way I don't, right? Because yeah. just the way I don't understand mathematics because is the way it was taught, right? It was taught in a way that just gets to my second point. Uh, which this is a proof of concept, the first part. The second point is because of this um, duality in relationship to knowledge being shut out at the point of, of, of its generation through generation, meaning generative through, um, through the, through a transparent epistemological process, say, because that's not available for, for Western modern mind that is dichotomized that's uh that's unnecessarily um um 
uh, separated out into polarities. The world seems more and more to people like a relationless aggregate, not less and less, right? Because if you had an, an epistemology that was soundly, uh, 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 that the society was soundly nested in, or endeavors like education were soundly nested in, the world would keep making more and more sense to you. The connections would be more and more. We'd be more and more able to understand other languages, right? And some people say this about, uh, I, I don't experience this, but some of the, say, Christian community priests, they used to only do, this is an anthroposophically related endeavor that came out of Steiner's uh, uh, meeting with Protestant um, um uh, with Protestant <clears throat> clergy, it was asked to do a renewal of of the Christian um, rituals, say, and the ceremony. Teacher, yeah. And um, in any case, uh, for a long time, I knew a, a priest in training. He didn't speak German, but he went to Germany in order to do the training. And so he had to understand, without understanding the language, what was being mm -hmm. taught. Right, and so this is an example of the way in which, uh, the way in which, uh, uh, if we don't shut out an aspect of 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 what it is to know the world, we can know the world in in profoundly intimate ways we never imagined. On the other side of that, if we don't, if we if we do shut it out, we 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 live in a world of absolute um, chaos as relates to sense making, meaning making, legitimacy capability and moral imaginative understanding of how to move forward in the world yeah and i would like to this confusion i'd like to tie this back to um to this the the the, the truth and science the consciousness soul and understanding soul um narrative that we've had a little bit going through this um through this talk today one and yes, another way in which Steiner is so interesting, and Audebindo, who we've discovered, so like in the last or uh, through um, through the videos that we did with uh, about John, Zach, and uh, and Greg, is that both of these guys are saying humanity has to go through a crisis. And in, in anthroposophical terms, the crisis, this crisis serves a purpose. We've got to learn, unfortunately, it's probably going to have to be extremely painfully, through extreme confusion, that truth doesn't reside in the intellectual soul. It resides in the spirit, in the consciousness soul, and that's where humanity is, according to both of these guys obviously this is a steiner term and uh, out of window uses the term supermind and yeah i haven't found any parts where he's specific about the timing of it whereas there is in steiner but that this this confusion which we've seen ramped up in the last three years to to levels that were unimaginable for us uh, 10 15 years ago it really is quite breathtaking and nobody's putting their foot on the brakes it seems to me there but this is this is symptomatic of the challenge that humanity faces as it moves from uh, an intellectual soul appreciation of the world uh, to a consciousness soul and awareness of that i am a spirit being as a, 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 a truth seeking spiritual uh being um yeah yeah beautifully said yes i th is there anything you'd like to add when you when you were doing your notes on things that you wanted to uh, to talk about for this episode have we skipped over any parts that you think mm, you know a lot of my notes were um in the on the preface in the introduction Mm -hmm. um, and then just struggling through this predicate subject, um, and, and it, it was worth it, of course, because it, it, it provided a breakthrough, a, a more intimate relationship with this work, because I can skim over that and understand it, 
in a way that's 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 narratively cohesive, but not with the deepest intimacy that 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 um, allowed for this conversation, which is really living in me. So also, I would like to say that um, uh, I think there's one und undigested bit, which is the idea that uh, um, that truth is is something that's out there and that's static right and it that that it's a fixed reality and uh all we're doing is uncovering it um di we're discovering it as a as opposed to being a participant in the creation of of a evolving reality so um uh yeah but, but i think we covered that pretty good in, in any case so uh, just for the sake of clarity and, and for, for for listeners and, and viewers as well so the importance of what you're talking about of subject predicate is this is the mechanism of synthetic knowledge okay this is this is this is the this is the link into to the chapter here predicate subject asks like two and two plus equals four in synthetic uh, uh mathematics okay you've got you've got a subject which is two and something is added to two and that makes for the, the new knowledge um and in the it's raining outside it's like uh so outside is the subject and you are adding a predicate to it to describe the outside and you're saying it is raining outside or it is cold outside um and that's why steiner um brings them in here because it's it's, I don't know if it's still the language of um, of modern day philosophy, but um, you, when you dig into Steiner talking about philosophy, he often talks about subject predicates. Um, so it's far more than just language. It's it's through language we make these synthetical, um, we create these new synthetic truths. Yes, and. Um... In exploring this language, uh, um, it's, it may be helpful to unpack just briefly the what what predicate means, which is a basically a proclamation. Right? Yeah. It's a it's a dictate. It's a it's a preconceived um, um, preconceived picture about which um, there's not only so that. Uh, this is hard for me to to get to because the language isn't as, it's not my language so it's not as intimate as it, it as it could be but it will be but the idea that I, also i'm a subject right and if i approach uh um that subject with a pre with a with a proclamation then i've i've I, i've had i've lost the experience of how that subject is a affected by that proclamation right so just just you know make prejudgments about people and see how that goes in your life right, mm -hmm. right. You, you you face them with prejudice and 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 uh uh you, you know your relationships won't go very well and and we we all struggle with that right i mean that's what marriage is <laughs> it's overcoming <laughs> uh the way you thought that she always does this it's, don't worry kids she's not saying don't get married it's not what jeff's saying <laughs> no it's it's the working through this relationship i guess yeah so it's a it's a really important and, and necessary point if people are reading through this and struggling the way i am so this was very helpful to to unpack that hmm. and and uh, i would like to encourage uh i think there are a lot of reasons to be extremely dubious about the value of chat gpt um but in this particular context, it's actually capable of giving some really clear, concise answers. So when I, was, I wasn't understanding antimonies so well, ask a few pertinent questions there and you get a lot of rich answers back. Um, and this is actually contrary to many experiences I've had with uh, ChatGPT over the last few, few months where it's provided fictitious answers or sometimes beyond stupid. Uh, when I say beyond stupid, I really mean so like a five-year-old could do better. Um, but in this, I think for me, in work in, in this particular field and using as a tool for unpacking some of the areas that I was unclear about, ChatGPT really is a powerful piece of powerful piece of kit. It is, and um, I would add a third element to that, which is 
that it is designed with a um, Kantian ideology um, embedded in it deeply. So it's an epistemologically um, the the outcome of its of the underlying epistemology of the way it's designed provides for only a coarse empirical um, uh, acceptance and it does it well. of reality, and it and it does it well too well, right? In a certain sense. okay. So th this isn't meant to contradict what you're saying, but I'm going to have to give an example of where it's like it fails even at like baby Kantian level. So my daughter, she came to me with a question about Italian. She, she it was why do we say uh, why do we say Christ? No, she didn't come to me about Italian, but I turned it into Italian. So she said, why do we say Christ? Uh, uh, but it's like Christus. And, and I said to her, oh, yeah, this is interesting. I haven't thought about it because yeah, in, in, in Germany, it's Jesus Christus. But in Italian, it's Christo. In Spanish, it's Christos. And in Swedish, it's Christus. And then I thought, but her question was specifically about Italian. So I said, uh, but yeah, I think actually, if you look at it, you think about it, um, and you obviously have to know it. So yeah, um, because I'm learning Italian, I, I, I know some of this. Um, I think all Italian words, or nearly all Italian words, finish uh, as like end in vowels. All right, so I said that. I don't know that for a fact. I know what. Let's go to Chat GPT and check it. So, Chat GPT, give me a list of Italian words that don't. No, first of all, go go back a step. So, uh, Chat GPT, how many words are there in the Italian language? Sorry, can't answer. That's too difficult a question. Okay. <laughs> Uh, how many how many words are there that end in vowels? Now I can't answer that question either. And this is really strange because it really, in my thinking, it should be go to a database of Italian words and just look at the last letter. So it really should be able to do this type of thing. But then something even stranger happened. So I said, uh, okay, just give me a list of Italian words and some examples of Italian words that end in vowels. I got a list of 10 words and it only um, six out of the 10 words that it gave me didn't end in vowels. I uh, didn't end in uh, consonants. They ended in vowels. And then of those words, it's like only one of those was arguably an Italian word. So it failed on multiple levels. And most kids by the age of five, six, they do actually know the difference between a consonant and a vowel. So they would have actually done that job. Uh, they would have been able to say, Chat GPT, you're stupid. Anyway, um, don't know why we're talking so much, or don't know why I am talking so much about Chat GPT. Well, but I do think I was, I was talking about the um, epistemological underpinnings of the, of the right, yeah. uh, say the 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 design and the process. So, so just to, to clarify, uh, I, I get what you're saying, and it has a um, it has an ideological narrative. That is may not be recognized as ideological because it sounds scientific, right? Which is uh, so. I, I've used the example of cell biology, and there are, there are um, uh, a handful of conventional um, mechanical models of what the cell is, particularly at the cell membrane, and if they're mechanical, it has to do with pumps and this sort of thing. Yeah. Where, whereas there's there are um, more sort of vital. Um, in say systems biology, uh, um, pictures of what the cell does and how it communicates, and Matt and I talked about that a little bit in the in the previous conversation that we had on uh, on the life uh, processes. <clears throat> but in the end, its narrative is, yeah, but you can't believe these are productive and they've contributed to 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 science and inspired some some innovations, but you can't really believe those because they're not they're not um, empirically provable, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, what is empirical and what's provable? What's, um, what's experienceable? What's, what is bounded uh, reality and knowing is all, uh, the whole chat GPT is, is a recapitulation of what we just talked about for an hour and a half in that sense. Final comment from me, I think. I think what's going to be interesting going forward is linking this idea of truth to concept as opposed to mental 
picture. Um, it just it's that something just struck me whilst you were talking that that um, because we've got mental pictures which are this like the essential argument of Kant as to why we can never know reality. So in that type of sense, we are we can feel a certain affinity with the way Kant's feeling, uh, the way Kant is thinking about it. It is a it is not the truth with our mental pictures i, I don't know I, I didn't want to go anywhere in particular but you're talking there's so like reminded me that mental pictures are a huge part of this um and truth is about concepts not individual manifestations of them which is how the reason how the intellectual soul works it's the science part of truth and truth and science except when they're transparent to you it and um the the important the, the important half of the mental picture is that it's that it is an individualized concept and it's the individualizing process not just the concept the in, but the self that is individualizing in relationship to 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 concepts and truth and knowing and perceiving and all of it that all, are all con in, a, in confluence in the mental picture. That's that in my argument, and this foreshadows our conversation. I'm sure going forward, it is that the mental picture is the is the container or the vessel for the way in which the that mental picture will start to move and yeah. become the imaginal. Yeah, it, exactly. It's uh, as I like the way you emphasize until it becomes transparent. It's, that's, it's really important to emphasize that when I realized that this is a manifestation, a single example of something that is infinite, impossible examples, then I have a completely different relationship. Well, uh, and that's what it. Steiner means uh, um, and when he's talking about the importance at, at the beginning point of an epistemology, that it's, um, that it's a, a self-taught moment, that it's a self-experienced moment. There's no way... Nobody can give it to you exoterically, right? Yeah. Everybody has to engage in it, and then you, the nature of proof is 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 made available as an experience that that is not also exoterically need need to be brought by a uh, by a mere external peer reviewed popularity contest of ideas, something like that. Yeah. Cool. That was Lovely. good. I'm looking for. I'm looking forward to doing chapter chapter three. This really is. It's 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 quite a short book, but uh, there's a lot of good material in there for clearing up some of the complex areas of philosophy of freedom. So. I'll say, yeah, and life. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and and that other minor thing. <laughs> yeah, I've loved. I've loved every minute of this. This was just a blast to me. Great. What yeah, I really enjoyed it as well. <laughs> cool. I'll I'll All press right. the press the stop button. All right.